I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. This month, with Christmas drawing near, join me on a journey called Advent. Constant Wonder is marking this venerable tradition, a calendar of hopeful anticipation, with daily short episodes, a new Advent experience every day all the way through the 25th. Together with special guests, we are seeking out the wonder and awe felt by so many people during this season of hope, reverence, peace, and goodwill. It's December 10th. Amber and Seth Haynes are the authors of The Deep Down Things, Practices for Growing Hope in Times of Despair. On day five of our Advent series, we heard from Amber Haynes about a pilgrimage she undertook in Italy that led to a profound experience of forgiveness. In this conversation, we hear from them both, Amber and Seth together, and our focus is silence. Maybe it's also about listening. The two are closely intermingled, of course. Listening just isn't easy whenever noise abounds, and most particularly, I suspect, if you are the one making the noise yourself. Amber, when you first met Seth, just how quiet a guy was he? He was zero quiet. (laughs) (laughs) Is that so? (laughs) He was maybe the loudest person in the room, but like in a cool way. It was very attractive still, but just gregarious and knew how to command a room. Well, if we're going to be talking about the value of silence, we have a problem here, don't we, Seth? <laughs> we do. We do. I, I also want to just build off what she said. Um, I was also very dark and mysterious. That's why she was attracted to me, <laughs> because I was so brooding and dark. And um, No, yeah, no. we do have a problem. I, I grew up Baptist, and man, I tell you, Baptist in the South means orchestras and pipe organs and a lot of loud screaming and hellfire and brimstone. And so again, I mean, it just kind of reinforced the cultural message that, you know, to be in charge was to be loud. And all my early role models in it, whether it was religious role models or business role models or, or whatever, all of my early male role models definitely fit that mold of the big, gregarious, loud, authoritative figure. My first unintentional and yet amazing, wonderful, awe-inspiring experience of silence was back in the soybean fields of the Arkansas River Valley when I was in high school. It was the dirtiest summer job I've ever had. They gave me a truck, they gave me a tiller, and they sent me into the fields in the river bottoms where wellheads had been stuck to pump and move, you know, natural gas and petroleum products from the river valley uh, to the good people of Arkansas. A wellhead is a very, very messy experience. I mean, it's nasty stuff and it's thick and it's muddy. And so my entire job was to step into this sludge and to sprinkle this powder on it, which was supposed to be dormant microorganisms I was then to till those microorganisms into the ground. Those organisms were supposed to wake up and eat away the petroleum product in the dirt. They gave me the nastiest truck because, of course, they were sending me into the nastiest area. And so this truck had no radio. It had no amenities. It was essentially just four wheels and an engine and a bed big enough to carry a tiller. I did have a 90s Walkman But I dropped it very early on, maybe the first or second week, into this sludgy material, which means it was completely ruined. So I spent the entire summer really just in silence, just in these fields working with no sound other than the hum of an engine or the the tiller roar. But when those were off, it was just birds and wind and the occasional cow. And it was really a sacred space. It was a really quiet space. I wouldn't have called it a sacred space at 18 years old, but the older I've gotten, the more I've come to understand that that was really like my first experience with the sacredness of of intentional silence. Fair to say then, at least in retrospect, and despite your boisterousness as a young man, 
safe to say you had felt uh, that summer, maybe other times too, the, the, the power, the value of silence, and you felt it pretty early in life. I did. In fact, I actually started to connect it back with some of my earlier experiences. Some of those were religious experiences. So there was, I think I'd just gotten my driver's license and there was a big party that night. You know, all the people were going to be there and so it was kind of the place to be. But there was also this monk who played a classical guitar and he was playing at the local church. And so I decided to go and listen to him play guitar, which was very quiet. It wasn't silent, but it was a very quiet experience, a meditative experience. And I decided to do that instead of go to the party. Could you perhaps point to a more recent experience where you felt that same importance of quietness and as you were attentive to the world around you, everything had a quality that could be described as spiritual? Yeah, I have a very poignant example of that. I just got back from a trip to Montana with a bunch of of dear friends. We were fishing and in the mornings I would go out and sit in this sort of like campfire circle. There were some Adirondack chairs and I have a dear friend named Mike, and Mike was on the trip. And the, these Adirondack chairs sort of overlook this beautiful valley that then gives rise to this enormous hill in Montana that is just stunning. And we were there three mornings. He came out every morning and sat next to me. Both of us had coffee. And we just sat there, didn't say a word to each other, just experienced the morning, experienced nature, experienced each other's presence without a single word. And at the end of the trip, I just told him how grateful I was for, you know, shared silence among friends because it was such a good moment of feeling like the expectations of entertainment or conversation or whatever the thing wasn't as important as presence. And I think that's the big lessons of silence. Silence frees us from expectations. So Amber, I'm going to take now Seth's experience of significant silence and bring that together with the spirit of Advent. So here is some beloved Christmas music. I want to talk just a little bit about the lyrics of this song. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. And now I should probably say, when we first got going on this topic, Seth mentioned places as he was growing up where religious congregations would expect to hear a fair amount of noise. And I myself, I know, and I I enjoy what it feels like to hear a great big pipe organ, those gigantic vibrations that go right down into the pews. And of course, there are times and seasons for shouts of hallelujah and choirs and the pealing of church bells. I, I, I get that. I'm thinking about now, though, the book of Ecclesiastes, where it mentions things like a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to speak and a time to keep silent. I would love your thoughts right now about the significance of silence in your life, and not just silence, but the, the, the quality of sacred silence. We are Catholic, and so there is a small chapel to the side of our sanctuary, and it's called the Adoration Chapel, and it's perpetual adoration. And so it is for 24 hours a day, and we believe we are literally in the presence of God. And so you walk into a space that is designated for complete silence and adoration. And something about that set-aside space, it is actually life-changing. It is healing. And it's amazing that you don't hear anything. I mean, you hear the bench squeak or something, but you will walk in and, and be alone sometimes, but you walk in and see, and I've seen people just in utter devastation, that just bringing everything that is deep, down up to the surface, but as like an offering in a space set aside for silence. And so that has been the thing that I believe has trained both of us the most. When you are attending the bedside of someone who is sick, that space you know is set aside for healing 
and is often really quiet. If you've ever attended a birth or a death, it is a very sacred, set-aside space. And you go in there with a sense of both awe and wonder every single time because there is a transition that is happening. What you walked into that room as is not what you walk out as. You're becoming someone new. We're so glad to have you along for our Advent series here on Constant Wonder. Our guests in this episode were Amber and Seth Haynes, co-authors of The Deep Down Things, Practices for Growing Hope in Times of Despair. Eric Schultzka produced this episode with help from Mamie Teeples and sound design by James Call. There are earlier installments in the series. You may have missed a few, and you can always go back and listen to those at byuradio.org, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And speaking of times in life when there are moments or even seasons of silence, please join with us tomorrow for another vignette from the natural world, It's about a creature whose quiet approach to hibernation nearly defies the laws of physics. For six months, she will not draw air into her lungs. To survive a cold that would kill her or slow her so that predators would kill her, she slows herself beyond breath in a place where breath is not possible and waits. I'm Marcus Smith. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio.